29, the beginning of the oracles to, Wait, no, not, yet. not yet, the oracles against Egypt. And remember, there were how many? We talked about this at the end of class last week. Seven. Against the Gentile nations, seven oracles against the Gentile nations. In the capstone, the epitome of, of a Gentile is an Egyptian. Of course, that's because of the history of Israel. 430 years in exile in Egypt. Well, 400 in Egypt and 30 or 40 or so in the wilderness, right? Yeah. Plus or minus 400 some years. Egypt, Pharaoh then representing, of course, the oppressor of, of God's people ultimately is the devil, right? Egypt is then the representation of the kingdom of this world, right? So, but Babylon is in Revelation as well. See, they kind of, they're double duty. But in, in the book, in this book, they're in Babylon, so Egypt gets to be the bad guy. In Revelation, uh, it's Babylon. But the kingdoms of this earth, of course, are kingdoms of law that God uses to bring about judgment for immorality, for sin, and ultimately for unbelief. All right. What do you need? Oh, yeah. Hey, that's a thing you could use. Uh, yeah, there they are. Nice. Oh, that breeze is so nice. Open the window. I don't care. Okay. So kingdoms of the earth are, we talked a little bit about it in the sermon. I didn't want to do too, too patriotic of a sermon. But I think the reason is, is that people look for hope, salvation, redemption, a future in the United States of America. But God has not promised any of those things through our country or for our country. Those are promised uniquely through Jesus. Right? So let the, you can rejoice in that the country had, has been the country that it is if you want. That's fine. Celebrate that. That God has so far restrained uh, the worst of human nature in our country, maybe, I don't know, seems to be less and less interested in doing so, which is also going to be God's work. Um, as you heard Joseph himself say, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. So even the most evil, tyrannical government, God uses for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Now that's a hard thing to believe, especially when people are dying or castrated or mutilated, um, whatever, separated from their families, etc. Right? It's hard to believe that God is going to use that for any good. But Joseph's story is the example, isn't it? Where they tried to kill him, then they decide instead to sell him into slavery. That's better, right? He's in prison how many times? At least twice, right? That it's recorded. And then, uh, but he ends up, God ends up using him to bring about the salvation of his whole family, even though they tried to kill him. So... Uh, this is the, uh, there was an article I should save, I should go find it and save it. Um, but it was from a woman who went through Soviet Russia and she was in this rural part of Siberia and the Lutheran church in Siberia recorded this, recorded her. She had had a pastor when she was like three or four and then they had killed all the pastors, right? All the Lutheran pastors. And so then, um, all her family had was a Bible and a catechism, which they kept hidden, right? And she learned the Bible and the catechism. And then at 80 some years old, you know, Soviet Union falls, they come, pastor comes, confirms her, she receives the supper for the first time. And like, um, is this important ladies? Oh, I'm sorry. Anyway, sorry, I feel like I'm in confirmation class. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, they come and like uh, Simeon, right? Now let your servant depart in peace. Your word has been fulfilled, right? Now. Um, and, and arguably, Russia is a better place today than it was before. Or, no, arguably not, actually. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so what we pray for from civil government when it comes to the church in particular is that they leave us alone, ultimately. But that requires constant vigilance and diligence, and that's where the church, I think, has failed. Thinking that it can just be pacifist and just, or like Amish, just inactive, right? And then you'll just, they'll just take it from you. Right? And they'll make your life miserable. And you'll be like, oh, what was me? And you're like, yeah, but you did nothing. Right? So that's why I thank God for the uh, Supreme Court ruling this week. It was in the email I sent out yesterday. Um, it was already in the Civil Rights Act of 1961, but the court reaffirmed it and made it even a little bit more explicit that they have to make reasonable accommodation for you to attend church. They can't say to you, you can't go to church. We have postal workers that have been told, a postal worker has been told she can't come to church because she has to do Amazon delivery or work Amazon delivery. 
And they, yeah, yeah. And I've told her, I said, they can't do that. And she didn't. And now it's like the Supreme Court ruled and said, you have to, you can't have somebody working seven days a week. You have to give them off for Sunday. Now, the Supreme Court did not rule. The one thing they said is that um, it would have to be, there would have to be, it's arbitrary, right? But like undo um, financial loss to the business if that worker weren't there on Sunday morning, right? Um, I think the Postal Service can't prove that. But um, it doesn't say, it didn't say that they, they can't like deduct your pay for not being at work. Well, fair enough. So they take some of your pay so they can go to church. So what? Right. So. And there'll be a lawsuit about that, I'm sure, too. <laughs> it, may, it won't make it to the Supreme Court because there's precedent now, but yeah. So we can thank God for that. Just the court is, uh, is saying, no, actually, First Amendment protects your, your right to assembly, speech, and religion, which all belong together. It's not enough to just say you can believe what you want to believe. You have to be able to say it, and you need to be able to say it with other Christians, with other believers, right? All of those go together. People think, oh, right to re- freedom of religion means that you can believe what you want to believe. No, it's connected directly to being able to say it out loud and not be persecuted for it. You have a right to, you have a right to, you have a right to say your opinions, <laughs> better or worse, right? Okay. Anyway, so we can thank God for that too. Mm-hmm. I forget what year that was. They made us work 12-hour days, and three days on, three days off, and then a day on, a day off, etc. Yeah. So every other weekend was like a Sunday. Yeah. Right, right. And I said, well, when I teach Sunday school, I go to church. Well, that's so often on the Sunday, we didn't have work available. So I finally said, and then the former told me, well, then you can go to the church for us. I said, thank you. Then I said, because now I'm losing 12 hours pay off my paycheck every two weeks, too. You can't just come in late? Huh? You couldn't just come in late? Well, they just didn't have work available. So oh, I got you. Work, you know, on the Sunday, it was like, you know, just... Well, yeah, but it's just money, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's just money. I know, I know that seems callous, but um, I, I kind of wanted to just say at the end of my email, uh, if you haven't read it already, go and read it. Uh, so you don't have any excuses. I mean, you never did, but now you, at least legally, you don't have an excuse. So anyway, but that's just me. I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm just, well, I'm just pastor. I want you to hear God's word. That's my job. Yeah. So I encourage you towards that. All right. Last week we talked a little bit of introduction about Egypt, um, but I don't think we read it, did we? No. Good. So let's, let's do some reading. And remember, there's a specific date, which is uh, 597. So what did we say this was? About two years before the fall of, si- of Jerusalem, but a year into the siege of Jerusalem. It was about a three-year siege or two and a half years. All right, so that we have a very specific date recorded here. And, oh, by the way, so we don't forget to get to it, we're going to answer Vicky's uh, concern. What was my concern? I asked you if you were concerned that Ezekiel's prophecy didn't seem to be answered. Yeah. I'm going to answer that question from back in 20, chapter 26. Yeah, three chapters later, we're going to actually answer that. Well, I'm going to give you an answer. Whether it be satisfactory is a question. <laughs> Ooh, we get a fishing story. This is cool. Yeah, this is a fishing story. In the tenth year, in the tenth month, on the twelfth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt the great dragon that lies in the midst of his streams, that says, My Nile is my own, I made it for myself. I will put hooks in your jaws and make the fish of your streams stick to your scales, and I will draw you up out of the midst of your streams with all the fish of your streams that stick to your scales, and I will cast you out into the wilderness, you and all the fish of your streams. You shall fall on the open field and not be brought together or gathered. To the beasts of the earth and to the birds of the heavens I give you as food. Mm. Then all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord, because you have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. When they grasped you with a hand, you broke and tore all their shoulders, and when they leaned on you, you broke and made all their loins to shake. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring a sword upon you, and will cut off from you man and beast, and the land of Egypt shall be a desolation and a waste. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Because you said, Nile is mine, and I made it. 
Therefore, behold, I am against you and against your streams, and I will make the land of Egypt an utter waste and desolation, from Nigdor to Sain, as far as the border of Cush. No foot of man shall pass through it, and no foot of beast shall pass through it. It shall be uninhabited forty years, and I will make the land of Egypt a desolation in the midst of desolate, desolated countries, and her city shall be a desolation forty years among cities that are laid waste. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them through the countries. For thus says the Lord God, At the end of forty years I will gather the Egyptians from the peoples among whom they were scattered. For that I will restore the fortunes of Egypt and bring them back to the land of Paphos, the land of their origin, and there they shall be a lowly kingdom. It shall be the most lowly of the kingdoms and never again exalt itself above the nations. And I will make them so small that they will never again rule over the nations. And it shall never again be the reliance of the house of Israel, recalling their iniquity when they turn to them for aid. Then they will know that I am the Lord. All right. I am the Lord God or Yahweh. All right. Now we did talk about the nature of prophecy. Um, and you, you could see this is what we call the prophecy or an oracle. I have to swipe the right place. <laughs> Sorry, I'll get my technology in, in line here. So remember, it begins, in the, it begins this way. The word of the Lord came to me saying, right? So that's the beginning. And then it'll say prophesy against, so it's who, and then it's thus says the Lord, right? So that's the beginning. Then the middle part is, so thus, this is the condition or what's true. Then, therefore, thus says the Lord God. So as a consequence, here's what's going to happen, all right? And you notice the conclusion is always the same. Well, there's actually a thus says the Lord God again, and that, which this part's weird. And then they shall know that I am the Lord God. So first, the word of the Lord came. Here's what he says. Thus says the Lord God. Therefore, here's, here's the consequence. And with the conclusion that they will know that I am the Lord God. Right? So we've been doing, I know, it's, it's breezy. It's so nice. Um, We've been doing so many oracles, maybe we haven't reviewed that. So I thought it was helpful to do that. All right. So, uh, by the way, when we have a judgment against Egypt, it's a judgment against Pharaoh. Or when it's against Pharaoh, it's against Egypt. They're together. Right? This is, we talked about this with shame, I think, a few weeks ago. Like, if, if we're ashamed of our president, we're ashamed of our country. Or if our president is being mocked in foreign media, which it is, from Australia to Saudi Arabia to France. I mean, they all make fun of him. I know we're not supposed to, but they all do, which means we're a mockery to them. Not just him, but we are, because we elected the fool, right? Right, so it's the same kind of judgments happening here. It's gonna be specifically against Pharaoh, but he's Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So he is the representative of all of Egypt, right? We elect representatives, right? Well. We select, I don't, I don't know. There's people who supposedly represent us. How's that? I think we have, I mean, locally, this is what's hard for us, I think, when we talk about this, is that, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I think, you know, um, Grothman or Ron Johnson um, represent me pretty well, actually. I mean, they're not perfect. They don't agree, I don't agree on everything. Same thing with our state representatives, actually. Uh, what's his name? Dennis, Dennis, Dennis? I'm trying to think, Senate and... He's an, he's an assemblyman, but he's not. Yeah, I'm trying to remember our resentments. <laughs> Here? I can't remember. Who's, I try to make sure I, I pay attention to what they. All right. Obviously, we know who's representing us very well. All right. Maybe it doesn't matter, but I, our state legislature does a pretty good job, I think, representing us too. Right? Yeah. Uh, but regardless, whether they do or don't, they, they, are, um, they are representative of us. Oh, we've talked about that too. What we see in our rulers and our elite class is actually the behavior of, of the people. People, they, they, rep, they reflect us. We're like, oh, they're more evil than we are. Really? Or does it go the other way? They're evil and then we're evil as a res result. Maybe it goes both ways. We call this the Overton window, right? What becomes acceptable just keeps moving farther and farther away from biblical truth. And it's everybody's involved, right? Not just... Yeah, every class. All right, anyway, back to this. Behold, I am against you. Ooh, that's not good. Do you want the Lord God against you? No, you don't want him as your enemy. So what happens as a result? The great monster. Ooh, you know about the great monster, right? 
Well, if we're in Egypt, what would be the great monster that comes out of the river? A crocodile. A crocodile. Very good. Yeah, so imagine like the crocodile the size of a dinosaur. Where's Patrick? Are there dinosaur crocodiles? There isn't a me megalodon or something? What's the big giant, the giant croc? That wouldn't fit in the Nile. It wouldn't fit in the Nile. Okay. Apparently there's a dinosaur that's a crocodile. All right. That's it. Yeah. Um, so this great sea monster lies, or great monster lies in the midst of his rivers. Whose? Pharaoh's. Who has said, my river is my own. I have made it for myself. Is that true? Now that's his pride or his hubris, right? It's my river and I get to say what happens to it. Mm, what's God going to say about that? Uh, not quite. No. I will put my hooks in your jaws. So he's going to turn Pharaoh into... Turn Pharaoh into fish bait. Right? If he's going to be hooked and then cause the fish of your rivers to stick to your scales. Sounds like Pharaoh's a big fish. Yeah? Getting it? That's what Ethan said. It's a fishing story. And I will bring you up out of the midst of your rivers and all the fish in your rivers will stick to your scales. Now, this is a metaphor, of course, right? He's talking about even his own people are going to revolt against him and consume him. Right? And I will leave you in the midst of the wilderness. Well, that's not a good place for a fish to be, is it? <laughs> you and all the fish of your rivers, you shall fall in the open field. You shall not be picked up or gathered. I have given you as food to the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens. I can't think of another, um, another time that the, this metaphor is used in the Bible. So it's pretty interesting, isn't it? He's like a giant fish. He's thrown into the, into the river. All the fish latch onto him and then they're all cast into the wilderness to die as food for beasts. Hmm. And then, as a consequence, oh, there, this is like an oracle within an oracle then, right? Because we had, then they shall know that I am the Lord at the end. But here even within this little oracle is, then all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord. I think I actually wrote this on the sheet but since I wrote it two weeks ago, I forgot. <laughs> Where is that? Uh, oh, I gave you all sorts of stuff about the sea, the sea monster. You can read about that in the third paragraph. Uh, the God of chaos, Rahab and the Leviathan. Uh, no, he's shown to be a fraud. Where is it with the... Hmm, I guess I never wrote it down. There's an oracle within the oracle. I didn't write it down, but it's true. Because they have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. What do you use a staff of reed for? Think Jesus' crucifixion here? What was the reed used for? Smack. Yeah, bruising him with the reed. It's also in Isaiah, right? In the Suffering Servant Song, Isaiah 53, where he's bruised with the reed. Yeah. So Egypt has been this, like, they've been constantly beating on Israel. That's the, the picture. And that's why they're being judged. Why? Because they've oppressed God's people. Okay? When they took hold of you with the hand... And then this is an interesting expression. Ethan said it differently, but you broke and tore all their shoulders. What did yours say for verse 7? That's what it is. Your, no, yours, said, yours was different. Read verse 7. When they grasped you with the hand, you broke and tore all their shoulders. Oh, okay. It's the same then. Um, so the picture here is, why were their shoulders be torn or bruised? Why would their backs be quivering? Or that was different in yours too. Yeah, they talk about like getting flogged or something. I it could be connected to that. Sounds like a weight. Yes, it does sound right. Remember, Jesus talks about the yoke of burden, right? So, so beasts get the heavy yoke. Play, and then Jesus says, "My yoke is easy and my burden is light," right? But if the burden is heavy and it's not light, which is he's talking about the law and the gospel there, but. Um, here, Egypt has put such burdens on Israel that their shoulders are like worn thin, right? The skin has been, and they're, or they're bruised, however you want to take that, right? And they can't even stand up anymore. You broke and made all their backs quiver. Yeah, mine was different than the same loins. Made your loins shake. Oh, I like that. Yeah. James, can you show us loin shaking? No, that sounds like the thing in those parades you're not supposed to go to. Right. All right, anyway. Uh, oops. 
Mental image, sorry. Um, I suppose we should be a little uncomfortable with this saying. Why? Because who allowed Egypt to do this to Israel? Right. So what Egypt means for evil, God's going to use for good, right? So that what they will, they, they will see who he is. This is just like what happens at the Red Sea with Egypt, right? What does Moses, the people are like, oh, we're going to die. You brought us out here to die in the wilderness. And what, is, what does Moses say? Be silent, be still, for the Lord will save you this day or something like that. I'm paraphrasing. He's like, just shut up and watch. So God has brought them to the point of complete catastrophe and disaster in order to show his greatness, that they not trust in themselves or their own. By the way, they don't even have chariots. They don't have swords. They don't have, they're not an army. All right, that comes later. All right, therefore, surely I will bring a sword upon you, that's Egypt, or Pharaoh, I guess it's feet, Pharaoh, right? Yep. And cut you off from you, man and beast. And, remember Pharaoh represents Egypt, the land of Egypt shall become desolate and a waste. And they shall, will know that I am the Lord, because he said, the river is mine and I have made it. Now, uh, to Vicky's question, just like we talked about with Tyre, that Nebuchadnezzar never breached its walls, so is happening here with Egypt. There's almost no evidence, just a, a fragment of a piece of pottery, basically, that Nebuchadnezzar ever conquered Egypt, or that Egypt was conquered. Now, Egypt had been conquered previously, and it pretty much had been, it had been obliterated for many generations already. But it's the same question. God's saying that they're going to be judged and made desolate, and there's not a lot of evidence that, that ever happened. Right? So it's a prophecy that doesn't seem to have happened. So we'll talk about that. All right, I'm giving you some more. I'm, I'm getting your conscience burdened again. Maybe it hasn't yet. Ah, now that's a good point. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Indeed, therefore, I am against you and against your rivers. Nothing worse than to be against the river, meaning uh, the Nile, and all the other tributaries. Why? If God's against the river, who is he against? Pharaoh and Egypt. But remember, for them... The river is divine. Yeah. There's river gods. It's a place of worship. All of that. This would be like tearing down the high places of the Canaanites. To overcome the river of the Egyptians is to do the same. All right. They had temples as well, but that would be the idea. And I make the land of Egypt utterly waste and desolate from Migdal to Syene as far as the border of Mine said Ethiopia. Ethan, yours said Cush. Cush. And I, actually, Cush is better. You know Cush? Anybody know where modern-day Cush is? I don't. We call it, I, actually, a better translation even yet is Nubian. You know where the Nubians are? <laughs> oh, no. We need a map. We need a map. Not, there are, I don't, there may be Nubians in Chicago. Uh, Nubia. Nubia. Related to Nubia, it's people. Well, that's really helpful. Is it Africa? It is in Africa. Yeah. So, it's modern day Sudan. Historical Kush, it says, is this area right here. Yeah. Or Nubia. So, so it's on there, and then Ethiopia is south of Sudan. So that's why Ethiopia is pushing a little too far. It should be, it would be Nubia or Sudan or Kush. You could use any of those. Sudan is modern day, right? I always get the, I don't know. Do you learn African geography in school? I, you did? Okay. Yeah. Sudan has great coffee too, though. Um, although, I don't know. It doesn't seem to be, well, anyway. It's hard to get it too. All these com companies are run by warlords, or countries, companies, countries, same idea, One run by warlords. So, yeah, but up in the mountains here is where the coffee grows. Yeah, they have mountains, because the river flows to the north from the mountains to the sea, right? To the middle sea. All right, that was helpful. Hey, look, I found a map quick. Couldn't do that before. It would have been a little map up in the, up in the wall. By the way, um, I don't know. I was talking to Mike about raising it. I think we should just 
uh, raise the money to get the fancy bracket where I can just say, I can just make the screen go up. Ah, oh, that would be nice. And when I want to do whiteboard, I just bring it back down and write on it. And then, aha! Uh -huh. I mean, it was like $800 or something. But, but it's, I think it would be worth it. Especially if like, you're going to do like a movie night or something and you want to get the sight lines up a little higher. Yeah. All right, anyway. Distraction. Neither foot of man shall pass through it, nor foot of beast shall pass through it, and it shall be uninhabited 40 years. Hmm. Again, we don't have any record of this. Now, there was a, I, I noted on the sheet here somewhere, there was a civil war after Hophra, who was known in Greek as Apres, because he wasn't actually Egyptian, he was Greek. We talked about that with, uh, what's her name, Queen of the Nile, the Netflix show, and everybody got upset in Europe because they cast an African woman to play Cleopatra, and she was actually Greek, you know, as white as the white can be. And yeah, well, anyway. So it's a never-ending source of memes now. Have you seen these? No. Where they, they'll say, net, you know, Netflix presents, and it'll be some historic figure, but it's a white person class as a black person. So it'll be Thomas Edison, and it's a black guy. And they already started this with Hamilton, right? Yeah. With the Broadway show. It was the same idea. They'll do it with Lincoln. They'll do it with anybody. It's kind of like where they sex change the characters. So it's like, um, where it's like, what was the one where it was Sherlock Holmes' sister, Enola Holmes or something? I never watched it. They try to gender, gender flip the character. James Bond is going to be male. I'm sorry. You can't make James Bond a woman. It's not James Bond. Even if you don't care for the character of a philandering spy, by nature, he's going to be a man. All right. Anyway. Uh, so where were we? Sorry. Squirrel. Oh, yes. I will make the land of Egypt desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate and among the cities that are laid waste. Her city shall be desolate again 40 years, and I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. I would suggest, even if this isn't a historic event, um, it is, it's, ba it's basically an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? Because God's people were oppressed for 40 years, Egypt in turn, will be oppressed for 40 years. You know. Remember, the reason why the, Egypt, or the Israelites had to wander in the, in the wilderness after leaving Egypt is because they wanted to go back to Egypt. So Egypt actually was a continual source of temptation. Also then an enemy of faith, right? Even after they were delivered from Egypt, they still were tempted to go back. Right? All right. So maybe that's what's going on here. And it's metaphorical or it's figurative. All right. Does every prophecy have to be fulfilled? Does it? Does it have to be fulfilled explicitly? Can it be fulfilled in other ways? Metaphorically? Or fulfilled multiple times? Fulfilled multiple times. Well, we would say scripture works that way. It's fulfilled historically. It's fulfilled in Jesus. And then as I think I said in the devotion yesterday on the congregation of prayer, said that... Uh, um, it's also fulfilled in us often as well, right? So like the, dis like the drowning of Pharaoh in the Red Sea is fulfilled in us too, as the old Adam in us is drowned by baptism. Pharaoh is a type then of the old Adam for us. But he's also a type of, of the devil uh, or of worldly power. I mean, he can fulfill multiple roles in different contexts. And there still is only one story, death and resurrection, right? Okay. So judgment against Egypt. And then, after the 40 years, this is the part that Ethan was a little... He's like, there's gospel. But it's a little confusing. Because God's going to do for Egypt what he usually says he's going to do for Israel or Jerusalem or Judah. One of those three. He's going to restore Egypt. Oh, how, what? what? Yes, I don't know. But. Yes, but. Okay. I will gather the Egyptians from the peoples among whom they were scattered. That sounds like Israel, right? Okay, good. I will bring back the captives of Egypt and return them to the land of Pothros, to the land of their origin, and they shall be a lowly kingdom. Well, okay, maybe that's a little bit of a, not a mighty kingdom, but a lowly kingdom. And it shall be the lowliest of kingdoms. It shall never again exalt itself above the nations, for I will diminish them so that they will not rule over nations anymore. All right. So it is kind of interesting that he is restoring them, but... They end up being a sign. 
All right, this is what happens when you rebel against God's word. Yes, he doesn't destroy you completely, right? But they can never rule again, right? This is, of course, our prayer against those who seek to, um, to exert ungodly power over us, right? Is that God would overthrow them, put them in their place, right? So that we can live in peace and quietness and godliness, right? Worship God and take care of our family and, and our neighbors and like stop thinking about all those weird people around the world. Okay, uh, so they shall no longer be the conf- be the confidence. What did yours say, Ethan? Sixteen. Uh, 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 the reliance. The reliance of the house of Israel. Hmm. But remind them of their iniquity when they turn to follow them. You see, so they're a sign to Israel of their sin. Why? Because they followed the Egyptians. Right? It's like I talked about in the wilderness, what was the constant problem? They wanted to go back to Egypt. Right? Um, and we also talked about that we do know historically, uh, Dorothy, you have to wait your turn. Um, we do know historically that we talked about Zechariah, was it not Zechariah? Who was the king of the? Uh, Zedekiah. Zedekiah. How he had cons- conspired with Egypt against Nebuchadnezzar which ended up being the reason why Zedekiah was deposed and all of Judah was taken into exile because they conspired with Egypt. So by, by actually not overthrowing Egypt, leaving them, although a lowly kingdom conquered, God is setting them up and say, here's what happens when you, when you conspire against me, right? And with the enemy, as I devastate them and I even leave them as a sign. This is kind of like when you conquer a city, you leave some survivors as a testament to tell others right? Or to go back and tell the king, right? You go back as a messenger to say what we did here. And that person ends up being a testament. All right. Good so far? Before we go on, okay. I know, like last week I was making all kinds of uh, about comparisons about like the devil and the serpent. Yeah. And I might be a bit of a stretch, but I, well, thought, I thought it was an interesting uh, observation. Uh, verse 5. Okay. Go back, verse 5. Um, yeah, I will cast you out in the wilderness, you and all, all the fish in your streams, you shall fall in the open field and not be brought together or gathered. I thought... There's lots of stories like that have that, right? Okay, yeah, I, I, I thought... People left or abandoned to, to have the birds devour them. Wasn't that what happened to Jezebel? They threw off the wall and then they left her there to be devoured by the beast? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I talked last week about Kind of sounded like Satan being cast out of heaven. Mm-hmm. Right. And maybe also this could be viewed that way. Also, um, specific, I was specifically thinking, you shall fall in the open field. I was reminded of Satan being cursed to fall in the belly. Oh, yeah. In dust. the dust. Eat the dust. All right. It's, my Bible's here suggesting this will come back in 32. Oh, yeah, it does. Okay. Oh. So that's more gospel. Or that's the last oracle, I think. All right. Good, let's keep going. So we get a second oracle in the same chapter, which is kind of more of the same, but it's going to flip to being um, Nebuchadnezzar against Egypt, not against Pharaoh. So it's kind of like narrow vision, broad vision. Does that make sense? We're going to do a zoomed in story, but then we're going to go out and do the bigger geopolitical judgment. Right? Yeah. Verse 17. You can all see it now, I think. No excuses. And it came to pass on the 27th year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to labor strenuously against Tyre. Every head was made bald, and every shoulder of raw. Yet neither he nor his army received wages from Tyre. The labor which they expended on it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Surely I will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He shall take away her wealth, carry off her spoil, and remove her village. And that will be the wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor, because they work for me, says the Lord God. And that day I will cause the horn of the house of Israel to spring forth, and I will open your mouth to speak in their midst. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. All right, that one's a lot shorter, huh? 
Yeah, I think we should probably start with the end. I'll raise it up so you can see it. Because uh, this verse is pretty tricky and there's no end of controversy about what's going on in this verse. So I'm going to make sure we cover this first and foremost. In that day, which is often used prophetically to speak of Israel, right? And God's deliverance of, Egypt, of Israel in particular, not Egypt. I will cause the horn of the house of Israel to spring forth. Which should remind you of the song of Hannah, the song of Mary, the song of Zechariah. Right? Um, You think the Benedictus, right? And we'll cause the horn of salvation to... What? I forget how it goes. House of his servant David, right? He will raise up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. There we go. Um, Or Mary, right? How's Mary's song go on that one? My soul, my... It's the Magnificat, right? You're running through. This is why we should find opportunity to do the prayer offices other times during the week, right? so that we don't lose those canticles. But anyway. Horn, um, by the way, horns kind of got a two double use. It's generally understood as being a sign of power, a might. You know, think about like a... Uh, what are animals that have horns? We'll use a rhino. You like rhinos, Patrick? No, Patrick's not paying attention. Rhinos? Rhinos have a big horn, right? What do they use the horn to do? To gore things, that's right. Or uh, the tusks, right, on an on a elephant, right? Defensive. So strength or might is usually how this is translated. Um, and then, but it can be also like pride or hubris. Like the, the, un, the undermining. Because we put our trust in our own strength or might, but that ends up being our undoing as well. So it's sometimes used in a, what do you want to call that? Like in an opposite sense. What you thought had strength had no strength at all. Dorothy, sit down, please. Sit down, please. On the chair. She's clearly two now because she's challenging every command. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, and I did give you a little note here on the sheet about how you can translate it either, you might say formally or literally. So it's horn, so you translate it as horn. A lot of people do a dynamic translation of this, meaning you, you transpose it into something more understandable. So strength or power would be one option. Um, some of you have, do any of you bring a paraphrase? You know, like the Message Bible or the Living Translation? Yeah, there's some over there. See if there's a living Bible or something like that. A living Bible. All right, yeah, look, look up that verse, verse 21, chapter 29. Um, they'll, they'll dynamically translate it, right? You see this, like Jesus, they, even ESV does this, the one we use in church. Jesus will say, um, I'm trying to think of that expression. Why do you call me evil because your eye is good? Is that how it goes? Why do you call me good when your eye is evil? He says that. ESV doesn't translate it literally. It changes it into something else. Why do you begrudge me my generosity? Like, it's not at all the same expression, right? It's totally different words, but they're trying to, they're like, nobody understands that expression, that Hebrew idiom, so we're just going to replace it with something that they do understand. It says the glory, the ancient glory of so read the whole verse. It says, And the day will come when I will cause the ancient glory of Israel to revive. And then at last her worth will be respected, and each will know that I will. Yeah. Right, and I think actually the meaning is right. <laughs> so this is sometimes where these, tra- these paraphrases, which aren't translations, where they dynamically replace things, actually get you closer to the, the way you're supposed how you should understand it. Now, it is an interpretation, right? So it may lead you astray as well, right? But that's, that's the idea. It's the ancient glory of Israel, which will cause to sprout forth. And then this is another kind of weird expression. I will open your mouth to speak in their midst. Well, that sounds like what we've heard before where Ezekiel's told to be silent and then he's told to speak. But that's not what's going on here, I don't think. This, from, this sounds like the period where God did not speak. Correct. That's what it sounds like. But I think the Living Bible got it closer which is to say your words will be respected by them. So now Egypt will actually respect the words you say instead of, yeah, which is, it doesn't sound right, right? Because that's not, but that's what it says. And then they will know that I am the Lord. 
So in other words, he's going to humiliate Egyptian to the point where, because Israel's horn will sprout, right, which is actually referring to Jesus, and they'll be humbled by the word of God. And now there's Christians in Egypt. It's ultimately fulfilled in that. Egypt maybe wasn't physically destroyed, but spiritually they were, and they were conquered by uh, originally Christians, then Muslims. <laughs> and now Christians and Muslims live there together, along with probably some others too. All right. Yeah, and the Coptics are, are there. Well, they're, yeah, they're in Egypt. That's right. Yep. All right. So, what's that? What are you mumbling about? Dorothy, don't stand on that, please. Well, she might, and then we'll figure out what to do. All right, so now we have this thing that doesn't ever actually happen, um, at least not exactly. He did go against Tyre. He did labor strenuously. Nebuchadnezzar did. And it does, well, at least Nebuchadnezzar declared victory, and Tyre never becomes a thing again. Doesn't become a... So whatever he did to Tyre was enough to just kind of put them in their place. Did he actually conquer Tyre? No, we said no. That was under Alexander. That comes much later, but, or a hundred years later. All right. But he worked very hard. It was like, I think, what did we say it was? Two years against Tyre, I think? Yeah. And then, then he sends him to the land of Egypt, or he's going to be given the land of Egypt, and he'll carry away. Again, we don't have an example of this. Just a little... But it could be that, you know, sometimes evidence just is lost, right? Nobody wrote it down. They were ashamed of it. They didn't record it, you know? You know, until this is why it's always, I think, our duty to um, be diligent to make sure that history is revealed and preserved. So, so there's people that, like, write the books about what happened in 2020 and, and document it and have the evidence. And here's what was said, and here's who said it, and here's who colluded with who. Request all the information, bring it out in the open, and preserve it. Hopefully, so that at least if there's a, a faithful summary of that, we don't make the same mistake again. Or mistakes, I should say plural, right? Because the worst thing that could happen is the whole thing just gets covered up and nobody does anything about it. You know, like the fact that the CIA assassinated a president. More than one, actually, but one for sure, JFK and his brother. They were responsible for it. And now they tell us, and you're like, oh, and we're, what are we supposed to do about it? Oh, that was 50 years ago, or whatever it was. So who cares, right? Hmm. Right, no, we actually need, even though it's long after the fact, nobody's going to be held accountable that was responsible. We need to know that they're capable of doing that, right? And then hopefully put safeguards in to keep them from doing it. If not, just abolish the, we just don't need regime change police force around the world. We just don't need it. We don't need intelligence, international intelligence. I know you don't believe that, but because you watch all the spy movies like I do. Yeah. There's a new se season of Jack Ryan on I Amazon. Because it deals with corruption, right? I'm going to fix it. Right. And they're like, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, even the Congress people on the show don't believe him no, that he can so fix the wrong. CIA. And I love how his girlfriend works for the WHO. I know. <laughs> It's like, they're just, they're just playing you. All right, anyway. It was very good, though. You know Jack Ryan, John Clancy, yeah, the, the books? Do you watch this, the new ones with John Krasinski? There's an Amazon yeah, series. There's two new episodes. Yeah, there's, there's a four, fourth and final season. Okay, anyway, good. Very good. All right. So anyway, um, this doesn't happen. And so what does that mean? Now, I gave you some options here to answer. I said I'd end with this to uh, answer Vicky's question. Um, we, we need to look at what it has to do with prophecy. So Deuteronomy 18 is what we probably need to cite. So we're going to go there and say, okay, what about prophecy? And if you say in your heart, uh, wait a minute, we didn't go, I went too far. Here we go. But, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak. So that's one reason why the prophet will die. Or, who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. All right? So if they claim to speak with God, uh, on behalf of God, but they aren't, death. Or if they speak on behalf of other gods, also death. This is in Israel. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word of the Lord, which... Don't, please. How shall we know uh, the word which the Lord has not spoken? 
When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is a thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall, shall not be afraid of him. All right, now it doesn't say you should die, right? But you should not be afraid of him. In other words, fear the word that he says. So uh, one way we could take this is to say that what we read in Ezekiel, since it didn't come to pass, at least not literally, right? That we can just disregard it. We don't, I mean, even if we were an Egyptian, we don't really need to fear that word. Um, I also suggest to you on the sheet um, that sometimes they f- speak figurative or hy- with hyperbolic poetry where literalism is, not po- imp- is impossible. So as Vicky said, maybe it hasn't happened or maybe it's just never going to happen in that way. But he's actually speaking of another kind of conquering of Egypt. And I would suggest to you that's happened. Because the Christian faith ultimately was the religion of Egypt for a while, uh, primarily, and, and now still secondarily, but it's still there. All right. Just like even if Tyre's walls weren't breached by battering rams, effectively Babylon won anyway. So even though it didn't happen exactly as God said it was going to happen, it did happen. The details are a little different. Um, but there is another aspect here that you have to remember, which I suggest to you, is that... Um, Sometimes God relents. Sometimes he changes his verdict. He says, I'm going to destroy these people. And Moses is like, no, you can't do that because you made a promise. And then God says, oh, yeah, you're right. And they're like, no, wait a minute. Did God change his mind? And I know sometimes we, we like to kind of second guess that. You know, like, well, God didn't change his mind. It's just a way of speaking. It's a figurative speech. Moses interceded. God says, okay, I won't do it then. As far as Moses is concerned, as we are concerned, it's Moses' intercession that changed God's mind, right? We have the same interchange with uh, Abraham on behalf of Lot and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, which, by the way, I posted a link on Telegram, which you probably don't use social media, but um, there are a couple architects that are not architects, archaeologists that think they found it pretty confidently that they know where Sodom and Gomorrah were. I like to say it's on the, on the Dead Sea because of the salt, but um, that's just... Whatever. But anyway, remember Abraham interceded on behalf of those cities? What if there's 50 found that are righteous, or 25 or 10, right? And God says, I will relent, right? So it is clear that God does change his mind. He relents. He, from our perspective, he promises one thing, and then, but on the basis of maybe a greater promise, when we remind him, he's like, oh yeah, that's right. And so... Is it possible that the course of human history has changed from what he told and that things don't exactly, they always work for good. God always uses them for good, but the actual precise manner that things happen changes based off of the actions of people. I mean, are we puppets as people? Do we do, you know, can we predict everyone's behavior and actions? No, only if we enslave them in their mind, right? With social media and drugs, (laughs) Then they're more predictable, you know, like cattle, right? Um, but even then, you know, like the dog bites the hand of its master sometimes, right? It's like, who predicted that? You can't, right? It's the way nature works. Uh, so I, I prefer, that maybe we think of history a little bit different, right? Of course, the ultimate conclusion of history God has already given and is known and has been known even before he made creation. Exactly what actions people are going to take And at what time? God knows and God uses. But God acts within history. So at this moment in time, this is what it looks like. And this is what God would say. But after the after events have transpired, now he might say things a little differently and say, well, it's not that he changed that that anything really changed ultimately. But in the short term, it can look different. I mean, I think the course of human history is fixed ultimately in the death and resurrection of all people, resurrection in Christ, right? The end of time. But it's exactly how that course will go. We can't know, for one thing. God has not revealed to us in any kind of precision, right? And that's the problem with reasoning Ezekiel, like he precisely describes the things that are going to happen in the next four years, right? Of Ezekiel's life, or in our life, for that matter, right? Uh, Plus, as I said on here, as uh, Peter says, right, that we... In First Peter, when he's talking about prophecy, that we speak as we've been given to speak, not because we actually understand the words we're saying. 
So Ezekiel is saying things that he doesn't even understand because they haven't happened or they're not going to happen in the way he thinks. That doesn't mean they're not true. So I think that's important to note. And God's judgment against Egypt is always true. If it's not, as Vicky said a long time ago, when I asked the question at the beginning of the class, or I suggested it, uh, ultimately, every kingdom of the earth will be, become subject to God, to the Lord, to Jesus, to the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, on the last day, right? Every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. So whether this has happened already to Egypt or isn't even going to happen until the last day, it's kind of immaterial in a way. God's word is true and it will happen. Um, so this is, as Ethan said, there's different ways you can take sometimes a prophecy. And the, the point of the matter is, is who is God? <laughs> right? Who does, who does Pharaoh trust in? His river, his gods, right? And they're false and they will be overthrown by, by the Lord. Whether in time or finally in eternity, you know, either way, right? Okay. Why do we need to know? Like Why do we need to know? We've got to think in a set that we need to know. Yeah, because we, we actually don't believe that God is actually working all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That what we mean for evil, God means for good. We don't actually believe that. I mean, not entirely. Maybe a little bit. We want to believe that, you know, like Fox Mulder's poster. We've been watching X-Files again. You know, I want to believe. There's the, I want to believe it. But on the other hand... Um, we don't actually have that confidence, which doesn't make any sense, actually. Uh, as, I mean, as, as a believer, it doesn't make sense according to faith. Because Jesus has already, as we heard in the sermon, he's already, he's already rendered the verdict. Why are we judging other people when Jesus already said, not guilty? If you want to render a verdict to your neighbor, say, I forgive you. Which is the verdict, verdict right? According to Jesus, he died for them. So forgive them. That... That's the only judgment that you can render. There's that double use of judgment, right? It can be negative, judged, you know, but it can be positive. You're judged forgiven, right? So it's the same idea as like, um, where, was I, where was I going with that? That we're, we're so caught up in the, you know, tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. When Jesus already said, you, he, I've already given you the answer, or well, at least what you need to know, which is, I'm your savior. I died for you. You are forgiven. And because you're forgiven, resurrection and eternal life are yours. So what are you worried about tomorrow for? Which you'll hear a sermon about probably next week or two. Actually, I think it's two weeks. Trinity six is probably the lilies and the birds. Yeah. That comes up every summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so here, maybe that's the real answer here at the end is that even for Egypt, I mean, this is the other way you could take this, this last bit. And maybe you want to take it this way is that this is about the conversion of the Gentiles, which we really haven't had much of. We had a little bit back in chapter 17, maybe? I don't remember, when we had a, a, a small prophecy about, about the Gentiles being gathered in as well. But here we have Egypt being converted. Now, what, what more impressive thing could God do? I mean, converting people who already have God's word is one thing. Converting people who've been the fiercest opponents to God's word, like Egypt, you know, the, I mean, that's the land of darkness and Pharaoh is the prince of darkness, right? It's, or it's bondage and slavery and there's, he's the slave master. And then to convert him or to convert them, how impressive would that be? Of course, that's the story of, of Paul. Yeah, exactly. The persecutor of the church becoming the, the, minister, the, the uh, missionary to the Gentiles in whom the Gentiles trust, actually, or come to trust, I should say. So you could take this that way. Is that Egypt then, they're of this great evil. It's a sea, he's conquered by his own sea monster and, and left out into the wilderness to die. And yet he's restored, resurrected, and actually is given to see the horn of Israel, Jesus being raised up, right? And, and, and coming to respect the word that the prophets have spoken, that is to believe. So when you have... Um, do we have any Egyptians conversion in the New Testament? Ooh, that would be a question. We have the Ethiopian. Or was he a Cushite? I think he was actually a Cushite, wasn't he? Now we know that's different. Sudan, not Ethiopia. But he was, oh, it was Queen Candace, right? Yeah, so, yeah. The Ethiopian queen. But he was, he was from Nubia. Which used to be actually a pretty impressive kingdom, by the way. 
go go look at ancient history. Like they had they had running water, they had gold. They were very powerful. Yeah, yeah, very powerful kingdom. And then oh, those Western Europeans. Oh well. All right, good. More Egypt next week. Because you know, we need more judgment. We like judgment. It's summertime. All right. Depart in peace. See ya.